Today, we're going to be talking about a case in which a childhood infection, strep throat, led to a much more serious infection of the heart called infective endocarditis. This 43-year-old man clearly remembered a childhood illness that he was told had damaged his aortic valve, but he was surprised by the long-term consequences of that damage when he began to feel unwell 33 years after that initial infection. As a young child, Frank recalls having many episodes of a sore throat, some of which were treated with antibiotics and some of which were not. At the age of 11, Frank began to have concerning symptoms, including diffuse joint pain, rashes, and progressive fatigue. After a long hospitalization, he was diagnosed with a condition known as rheumatic fever. He and his parents were told that the condition likely began with a throat infection caused by streptococcal bacteria. During that initial infection, Frank's immune system recognized and deployed immune defenses to eliminate the bacteria causing his pharyngitis. Although the immune system effectively cleared the throat infection by way of T cell activation and B cell antibody production, there was cross-reactivity with otherwise healthy tissues in Frank's body. In rheumatic fever, the vigorous host immune response can mistakenly attack the tissues of the heart valves. In Frank's case, his immune response damaged the leaflets of his aortic valve and also caused the other symptoms he experienced at age 11, including the joint pain and rashes. Like many patients with a history of rheumatic fever, the majority of Frank's symptoms eventually improved and he was able to lead a relatively normal lifestyle into adulthood. He worked as an accountant and enjoyed many physical activities with no health complaints. He had been warned that he was at an increased risk for infections of his previously damaged heart valves, even if relatively harmless bacteria were allowed to circulate in his bloodstream. For this reason, each time Frank visited a dentist, he remembered to take antibiotics prophylactically. Bacteria with relatively low virulence make up a part of the normal oral microbiota. They're routinely allowed to enter the bloodstream through biting and chewing, but they're usually cleared successfully by the liver and spleen before they cause any disease. Dental treatments release large numbers of these less virulent bacteria into the systemic circulation, and when blood flow through a damaged valve is more turbulent than usual, as it was in Frank's case, even these relatively harmless bacteria are able to colonize the damaged valve tissue and replicate there, causing infective endocarditis. The type of infective endocarditis associated with a history of rheumatic fever is called subacute bacterial endocarditis, or SBE. SBE has a long incubation period and typically involves bacteria with low virulence. Since these bacteria don't have potent intrinsic virulence mechanisms to damage and invade healthy tissue, SBE typically requires prior structural abnormalities of the heart valves in order for the infection to become established. Because the bacterial causes of SBE are relatively weak pathogens, this disease typically progresses quite slowly, usually over weeks or months, and patients like Frank often simply present with a few weeks of fatigue and unexplained fevers. The counterpart to this disease is called acute bacterial endocarditis, or ABE. ABE typically has a short incubation period because it's caused by more virulent bacteria, like Staph aureus, that have somehow gained access to the bloodstream. Because these bacteria are more virulent and possess intrinsic mechanisms to colonize, invade, and damage host tissues, there's often no prior structural damage to the heart required for this form of infective endocarditis. ABE also progresses much more rapidly and can lead to serious life-threatening complications within days or weeks. During the history, Frank remembers to tell the physician on duty that he suffered from rheumatic fever as a child. He also admits that for his last two dental cleanings, he opted not to take the prophylactic antibiotics. He'd forgotten to fill his prescription, and after so many years of good health, he wondered if they were really necessary. 
On physical examination, the physician notes that Frank is febrile and pale. While listening to Frank's heart, the physician hears an early mid-systolic murmur audible over the right upper sternal border, consistent with mild aortic stenosis from the prior scarring and valve damage that happened during his rheumatic fever. This murmur had been previously noted in Frank's medical record, but there's also a new diastolic murmur, an abnormal heart sound that concerns Frank's physician for new backflow or regurgitation across the aortic valve. He also notes several small hemorrhages within Frank's nail beds, as well as some painful subcutaneous nodules on Frank's palms and soles. There's no evidence of the non-painful erythematous lesions on Frank's palms and soles called Janeway lesions, which are another classic physical finding associated with IE. But Frank's eye exam reveals several hemorrhagic lesions of the retina called Roth spots on the right eye. Because of Frank's history of rheumatic fever and the classic physical findings associated with infective endocarditis, the physician orders a CBC, an echocardiogram, and a CT scan of Frank's abdomen, as well as blood cultures from two distinct sites. The CBC shows anemia. This happens because of the bone marrow suppression that's typically associated with a chronic inflammatory state in the body. The echocardiogram shows chronic scarring of the leaflets of the aortic valve, slightly restricting the outflow of the blood across this valve, findings consistent with aortic stenosis. But the echo also shows that the valve is incompetent, that it's allowing significant backflow of blood across the valve with each beat of the heart. This is consistent with the aortic regurgitation murmur that the physician noted in Frank's physical findings. Most worrisome of all is the visualization of a new mobile mass on the lower portion of the aortic valve. This is consistent with an aortic valve vegetation, a collection of bacteria and platelet fibrin aggregates that collect on the valve tissue. Because this vegetation is unstable, it can throw clots or septic emboli that are carried into distal small vessels where these microemboli block the terminal vessels, leading to ischemic damage to the surrounding tissues and hemorrhages like the ones noted on Frank's physical exam. Frank is admitted to the hospital, and within 48 hours, both cultures grow Streptococcus viridans, bacteria that live primarily in the mouth and which are a common cause of subacute bacterial endocarditis. Most viridans group strep are susceptible to several antibiotics, so Frank is immediately started on specific and targeted antibiotic therapy based on these culture results. His fever resolves and his blood cultures are negative when they're checked again over the following week. IV antibiotic treatment is continued for several weeks to ensure that this very serious infection of his heart valves is completely cured and causes no further damage. During this time, Frank is followed very closely by his physician to ensure that there are no other complications from this infection, including new embolic events, abnormal heart rhythms, or evidence of heart failure. Frank is eventually able to slowly return to his daily activities, but his heart is carefully monitored to ensure that his damaged aortic valve doesn't result in impaired cardiac function. Also, Frank is reminded about the importance of the appropriate use of antibiotics to prevent recurrence of this type of infection. If, as a child, Frank's strep throat had been more quickly diagnosed and treated, the likelihood of damage to his heart valves would have been greatly reduced. Because strep pharyngitis and then rheumatic fever can lead to severe cardiac complications, physicians take a number of key steps when they suspect that a patient has strep throat. This includes confirming a streptococcal etiology, either through a throat culture, if results can be available within 48 hours, or by performing a rapid antigen detection test. Considering other factors like the time of year and the age of the patient can also help a physician decide whether strep pharyngitis is a likely diagnosis. Diagnosing and treating strep throat promptly is the best way to prevent the immune-mediated rheumatic fever that can follow this infection, 
and can cause permanent structural damage to the heart. Once the damage has occurred, patients like Frank are at an increased risk of suffering from infective endocarditis for the rest of their lives.